Zootopia, a city that inspired so many hours of children singing it will surely be remembered as a classic Disney musical despite having only one song in it. The perfect city where every kind of people has their own district gentrified to their needs. The movie Zootopia has been praised by paid wanker snobs, YouTube essayists, and general fun seekers alike for daring to talk about real issues in an animated film for children. The movie shows us the divide between rural farm life and big city apartments, the bureaucracy of police, public discrimination, microaggressions, and the burden of becoming a volunteer educator. This world never really gives a toss about the characters' genders or their relationships, but the easily witnessed divisions of animal species reflect how us humans are treated differently depending on our skin tone and facial structure. Except... not really. No matter how worthy the topic of racism is to be the focus of a movie, it's not actually what Zootopia focuses on. Sure, there's a joke with parallels here and there. A bunny can call another bunny cute, but when other animals do it, it's a little... <gasps> but none of those are the main theme. When you get right down to it, Zootopia isn't about racism at all. Zootopia is about psychiatry. Zootopia is a 2016 animated film set in a world where humans have either gone extinct or never existed, where in our place various other animals have developed sapience and a society with infrastructure very similar to our own. The story follows our bunny protagonist, Judy Hopps. Everyone's name is a pun, please start the process of getting over it now. Judy Hopps, a small town crack farmer with dreams of moving to the big city to become a tool of the capitalist bourgeois and enemy of the people. Assuming this isn't the very first video essay you've ever seen, you're probably expecting a summary of the plot from start to finish to get people who didn't see the movie up to speed, followed by the essay part of the video essay. Yeah, that isn't going to work here. Zootopia isn't a movie that empties its depth on the first viewing. Its foreshadowing is indirect, and it doesn't show its hand until the main twist, and hardly even then. That. That's where we have to start for this to make any sense. This part of Zootopia is a mystery story. A small number of animals are tearing up their neighbors' faces, or as the movie calls it, going savage, alluding to the fact that they drop down on all fours like the regular animals we have in real life. It's Judy's job to prove herself as a detective by finding out why this is happening. The plot twist reveals that it's happening because of a conspiracy to intentionally drug people into a violent state. Not just random people, but a specific minority. The target is animal species that are historically predators. The purpose of this effort is to sow the seeds of public prejudice against all people in that category and leverage that prejudice to establish a political hierarchy with prey species in charge and predators under surveillance. Did I mention this is an animated movie for children? To understand how this reflects the system of oppression through psychiatry, we first need to define what psychiatry is, and more specifically, biopsychiatry. Not to be confused with psychology, the study of the mind, the definition of psychiatry is the diagnosis and treatment of mental disorders. With that definition comes a lot of assumptions, like the assumption that the things we're treating are in fact disorders, that we should treat them, at least in some cases, and so on and so forth. Biopsychiatry refers to an assertion used to justify psychiatry. The assertion that every phenomenon which the psychiatric system claims as a disorder under its domain is a biological brain disease. It may have something to do with biology. This assertion is most commonly made about depression or hearing voices, but ultimately it extends to every psychiatric diagnosis, including cultural identities like transgender, autistic, and asexual, which as someone who is all three of those things, I would hope we already agree aren't diseases needing to be cured. Proponents of biopsychiatry assert that all instances of depression are caused solely by chemical imbalances in the brain. And this assertion has some serious problems, which we address more in depth in our video about 13 Reasons Why. For Zootopia's sake, I'm going to focus on the assertion that everyone who hears voices has a biological brain disease called schizophrenia, as it's one often used as a scapegoat for violence. 
One problem with biopsychiatry for hearing voices is that there's no evidence for it. There's no blood test for schizophrenia, and brain scans can only show correlation with other brain scans that we don't understand the implications of either. People who hear voices may have higher rates of depression, anxiety, etc., but that could easily be attributed to the fact that people who hear voices face higher rates of violence and abuse and a hundred other kinds of discrimination. This is one of the reasons I describe psychiatry as pseudoscience, because as soon as we find a specific, testable, biological cause for a psychiatric issue, as we have, for example, with Alzheimer's disease, the study of that issue is immediately taken up by neuroscientists and biologists, and it ceases to be in the domain of psychiatry. Another problem is that there shouldn't be a blood test for schizophrenia, because in our present cultural climate, that would be fuel for eugenics. And in case you're unclear as to why eugenics is bad, we shouldn't try to get rid of voice hearers because their existence doesn't actually harm anyone. The Hearing Voices Network has done great work in Europe, and to a lesser extent the United States, spreading the message that people who hear voices don't necessarily need a psychiatric intervention, that they can instead learn to work with their voices in a way that's benign or even beneficial. You may have a helpful voice in your head right now asking why you're six minutes into a video about Zootopia, and only half that time has been spent talking about Zootopia. Well, voice in your head, let me fix that for you. I'm not a furry, though. In the city of Zootopia, all animal species live together in harmony, regardless of their historic status as predators and prey. Or so it seems in Judy Hopps' optimistic idea of the big city. Gone are the days of war, replaced by the negative peace of segregation. Much like in real life, not many people express overt prejudice, although some do. You think I'm gonna believe a fox? But even among those with generally positive, egalitarian values, there's a lot of subtle, deep-seated prejudice that rears its head in the most inopportune moments. The conspiracy to portray mentally ill people predator animals as violent would not have the desired effect if there was not already some amount of widespread prejudice for biopsychiatry to prey upon. We reserve the right to refuse service to anyone, so beat it. Judy Hopps herself is no exception. Nick Wilde's speech to Judy during his first encounter with her all but spells it out. Judy has an unrealistic, liberal's idea of how the world works, a worldview that blinds her to her own prejudice. Tell me if this story sounds familiar. Naive little hick with good grades and big ideas decides, hey, look at me, I'm gonna move to Zootopia, where predators and prey live in harmony and sing kumbaya, only to find, whoopsie, we don't all get along. Everyone comes to Zootopia thinking they can be anything they want. Well, you can't. You can only be what you are. Judy admonishes her parents for their bigotry, refuting the example of her childhood bully by saying that his actions don't reflect on all foxes. Gideon Gray was a jerk who happened to be a fox. I know plenty of bunnies who are jerks. But we see that when push comes to shove, she does harbor some prejudice on an instinctual, emotional level, even if she can voice an opinion that everyone is equal. The fox repellent is the first sign we're shown of this crack in her perfect liberal facade. She debates with herself whether to carry around fox repellent, scoffing at it, but then ultimately deciding to take it, just in case, to keep it in her utility belt on duty, in plain view of the fox that she wants to mold into her partner. Fox repellent? Yeah, don't think I didn't notice that little item the first time we met. After being rightly offended by Judy's something in their biology speech, Nick decides to test her by showing the slightest hint of aggression. As he expected, she goes for the repellent. She's perfectly content to befriend a mentally ill fox, but as soon as he displays a fox predator instinct scary mental illness symptom, her fear reveals her prejudice. A victim of violent crime attributes his trauma to night howlers, and Judy makes a giant leap of logic that he must be referring to a group of white wolves who all have Tourette's. Night howler is actually a slang term for a toxic plant, which she would have already known if she had any foxes as friends growing up. My family, I would just call them night howlers. And she thinks that the job of a meter maid accomplishes anything beyond wringing the life out of poor people. These are the issues that carve out space for Judy to grow as a character. Though she is still a cop by the end, can't win them all.
Zootopia makes an effort to emphasize that bunnies are disabled. Judy gets put through a fitness test designed for rhinos and bears. She has to prove that she's the fittest bunny in the world just to be considered eligible, let alone equal. And even after that, she was really only hired as a class trader because of an inclusion initiative for the public feels. Mammal inclusion initiative? She's the token minority, and she plays the part exactly as her tokenizers would hope. She disproportionately targets the lower class, she participates in the ritual indoctrination of youth, and she repeats the propaganda that there's a category of violent people with an immutable, violent biology. Zootopia shows how a dominant paradigm can permeate public consciousness, alter legal and corporate policies, and be shielded from criticism due to confirmation bias. The paradigm that there are two categories of people, those who are predisposed to violence and those who are incapable of violence, both determined by their immutable neurological wiring, inevitably leads to prejudicial fear. The violence in Zootopia, like in real life, isn't inborn, it's conditioned. But the public and those in power already harbor prejudice against certain kinds of people, so when the most surface-level statistics point a finger at those people, they're taken at face value. Predators bad, therefore predators are the ones chosen to frame in a smear campaign, therefore predators bad. That's confirmation bias in a nutshell. Zootopia says, okay, so what if there's a correlation between mental illness and violent crime? There isn't, unless you count the fact that being labeled mentally ill makes you more likely to be a victim of violent crime, but let's pretend there is. Even then, prejudice is still just prejudice. A lot of bad people belonging to a certain neurotype doesn't mean the neurotype is inherently bad. It may very well be a case of targeted conspiracy, or more realistically, biased over reporting. The characters in Zootopia look at reports of crime by predators and decide that predators should be barred from public-facing jobs lest they scare the public. Real-life politicians and lobbyists look at reports of crime by mentally ill people and argue that mentally ill people should be barred from voting, and medical care, and self-defense lest they become a danger to themselves or others. What all of these people are missing is that the facts were made up by people with an agenda. The conclusions are wrong because the premise is wrong. Biopsychiatry is wrong. 